Chapter Seven, Part Three of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume Two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mysteries of Paris by Eugène Sue, Chapter Seven, Part Three. And these words were really pronounced in entire sincerity of meaning, not that compunction for his many crimes touched the brigand's stony heart but he contrasted the happy peacefulness of the lives of these labourers to his own wretched stormy existence and still further did he envy them when he reflected upon all that the chouette might have in store for him he shuddered as he reflected upon the future she would provide for him and more than ever regretted by having recalled his old accomplice having for ever lost the means of dwelling with good and honest persons such as those with whom the chourineur had placed him father chatelain surveyed the schoolmaster with an air of surprise my good man said he i did not know you were so utterly destitute alas yes it is even so i lost my sight by an accident while working at my trade i am going to louvre to endeavour to find a distant relation there who i hope may be willing to assist me but you are aware people are not always so open-hearted as they should be they do not like distressed objects such as myself coming to claim kindred and are frequently harsh and unkind answered the schoolmaster sighing deeply but the most selfish heart would grieve at your distress replied the old labourer the most hard-hearted relative would pity a man like you a good and honest workman overtaken by a sudden calamity and left without hope or help then the moving spectacle of this young and tender child your only friend and guide would wring pity from the very stones but how is it that the master for whom you worked previously to your accident has done nothing for you he is now dead said the schoolmaster after a short hesitation and he was my only friend on earth but then there is the hospital for the blind i am not the right age to qualify me for admission poor man yours is indeed a hard case do you think it likely that in the event of my relation at louvre refusing to assist me your master whom i already respect without knowing would take pity on me unfortunately you see the farm is not a hospital our general rule is to grant all infirm or afflicted travellers a temporary shelter of a night or day in the house then some assistance is furnished and they are put on their road with a prayer to kind providence to take them under its charge then you think there is no hope of interesting your master in my unhappy fate asked the brigand with a sigh of regret i tell you what is the general custom here my good man but so compassionate a person as our master might go any lengths to serve you do you really think so said the schoolmaster oh if he would but permit me to remain here i could live in any retired corner and be happy and grateful for such a mere trifle of subsistence as i said before our master is capable of the most generous actions but were he to consent to your remaining at the farm there would be no occasion for you to hide yourself you would fare in every respect as you have seen us treated to-day some occupation would be found for your son suitable to his age and strength he would not want for good instruction or wise counsels our venerable minister would teach him with the other children of the village and in the words of scripture he would grow in goodness and in stature beneath the pious care of our excellent cure but the best way for you to manage this will be to lay every particular of your case and petition before our lady of ready help when she comes into the kitchen as she is sure to do before you start on your journey to-morrow morning what name did you call your lady by nay i meant our mistress who always goes by that appellation amongst us if she interests herself for you your suit will be granted for in matters of charity our master never opposes her smallest wish oh then exclaimed the schoolmaster in a joyous tone already exulting in his hoped-for deliverance from the power of the chouette i will thankfully follow your advice and speak to her whenever i have the blessed opportunity this hope found no echo in the mind of tortillard who felt not the slightest disposition to avail himself of the offers of the old labourer and grow up in goodness under the auspices of the venerable cure the inclinations of bras rouge's son were anything but rural 
neither did his turn of mind incline to the pastoral faithful to the code of morality professed by the chouette and promulgated by her he would have been severely distressed to see the schoolmaster emancipate himself from their united tyranny and he now thought it high time to recall the brigand from the illusory visions of flowery meads and all of the etceteras of a country life in which his fancy seemed revelling to the realities of his present position yes oh yes repeated the schoolmaster i will assuredly address my prayers to your lady of ready help she will pity me and kindly tortillard here interrupted him by a vigorous and artfully managed kick so well directed that as before it took the direst effect on the most sensitive spot the intense agony for a time quite bereft the brigand of speech or breath but remembering the fatal consequences of giving way to the feelings which boiled within him he struggled for self-command and after a pause of a few minutes added in a faint and suffering voice yes i ventured to hope your good mistress would pity and befriend me dear father said tortillard in a hypocritical tone you forget my poor dear aunt madame la chouette who is so fond of you poor auntie chouette she would never part with you so easily i know directly she heard of your staying here she would come along with m barbillon and fetch you away that she would i know madame la chouette and m barbillon why this honest man seems to have relations among all the birds of the air and fishes of the sea uttered jean rené in a voice of mirthful irony giving his neighbour rather a vigorous poke with his elbow funny isn't it claudine oh you great unfeeling calf how can you make a joke on these poor creatures replied the tender-hearted dairymaid returning jean rené's thrust with sufficient interest to compromise the safety of his ribs is madame la chouette a relation of yours inquired the old labourer of the schoolmaster yes a distant one answered the other with a dull dejected manner and is she the person you were going to louvre to try and find asked father chatelet she is replied the blind man but i think my son overrates her zeal on my account however under any circumstances i shall speak to your excellent lady to-morrow and entreat her aid to further my request with the kind charitable owner of this farm but added he purposely to divert the conversation into another channel and so put an end to the imprudent remarks of tortillard talking of farms you promised to explain to me the difference that exists in the management of this farm and farms in general i did so replied father chatelet and i will keep my word now after having planned all i told you about the charity of labour our master said to himself there are many institutions where plans are devised and rewards assigned for improvements in the breed of horses cattle sheep and other animals for the best constructed ploughs and other agricultural implements and i cannot help thinking that all this time we are not going to the fountain-head and beginning as we ought to begin by improving the condition of the labouring classes themselves before we give all this heed to the beast which perisheth good beasts are capital things but good men are better and more difficult to meet with give your horses and cattle plenty of good food clear running water place them either out of doors in a fine healthy atmosphere or give them a clean well-managed stable with good and regular attendance and they will thrive to your heart's content and be capable of reaching any degree of excellence but with men look you it is quite another thing you cannot elevate a man's mind as you can fatten an ox the animal fattens on his pasture because its taste gratifies his palate he eats because he likes what he feeds on and his body profits and thrives in proportion to the pleasure with which he has devoured his food well then my opinion is that to make good advice really profitable to men they should be enabled clearly to perceive their own personal advantage in following it just as the ox is profited by eating the fine grass that grows around him father chatelet said several voices precisely the same but father chatelet exclaimed another voice i have heard talk of a sort of farm where young thieves who might in other respects have conducted themselves very well are taken in taught all sorts of farming knowledge and fed and treated like princes you have heard quite right my good fellow 
there is such an institution and as far as it goes is founded on pure and just motives and is calculated to do much good we should never despair for the wicked but we should also hope all things for the good suppose now a strong healthy and industrious young man of excellent character ready and willing to work but desirous of receiving good instruction in his way of life were to present himself at the place you are speaking of this farm of reclaimed thieves well the first question would be well my chap are you a rogue and a vagabond no oh then we can't receive you here we've no room for honest lads what you say father is right every word of it rejoined jean rené rascals are provided for while honest men want and beasts are considered and their condition continually improved while men are passed over and left in ignorance and neglect it was purposely to remedy what you complain of my brave lad that our master took this farm as i was mentioning to our blind visitors i know very well said he that honest men will be rewarded on high but then you see it is far and long to look forward to and there are many and much to be pitied are they who can neither look to such a distance nor wait with patience the indefinite period which bids them live on hope alone then how are these poor depressed and toil-worn creatures to find leisure thus to seek religious comfort rising at the first dawn of day they toil and labour with weary limbs till night releases them and sends them to their wretched hovels sunday is spent by them at the public-house drinking to drive away the recollections both of their past and future wretchedness neither can these poor beings turn their very hardships to a good account by extracting a useful moral from them after a hard day's work does their bread seem less coarse and black their palate less hard their infants less sickly and meagre their wives less worn down by giving nourishment to the feeble babes of their breast no no far from it alas the thin half-starved mother is but ill calculated to nourish another when she is obliged to yield her slender share of the family meal to still the clamours of her famishing children yet all this might be endured ay even cheerfully for use has familiarized them with hardship and privations their bread is food though coarse and homely their straw bed rests their weary limbs and their children though stunted and sickly live on all these i say could be borne did no comparison arise between their own poverty and the condition of others but when they visit the town or city on market days they see an abundance of good white loaves crowding the windows of the bakers shops warm soft mattresses and blankets are displayed for sales to such as have the means of purchasing children fresh and blooming as the flowers of may are playing joyously about and even from the superabundance of their meals casting a portion to the dogs and other pet animals ah human courage gives way at this reverse in the picture of human condition and when the tired careworn men return to their mud hovels their black bread and straw pallet and are surrounded by a number of squalid half-starved wailing infants to whom they would gladly have brought the share of cakes and buns thrown by the pampered children of great towns in the streets or cast to the animals then bitter discontent and repining take possession of their mind and utterly forgetting that on high is one who careth for all they say why is this difference allowed and if there must be both rich and poor in the world why were we not born to riches why should not every man have his turn in worldly prosperity we are not justly used or fairly treated in being always poor and hard-worked of course all this is both sinful and unreasonable neither does it in any manner serve to lighten their load and yet they must go on bending staggering under the burden too heavy for them to bear till they sink utterly exhausted and worn out they must toil toil on without hope without relaxing their daily efforts or without once daring to entertain the idea that by a long continuance in honest virtuous industrious conduct the day might come when like the great creator of all 
they might rest from their labours and behold peaceful ease succeeding the hard gripping hand of poverty think of a whole life passed thus in one continued struggle for the bare means of life without a glimmer of hope to shear the thorny path what must such a life be like why it would resemble one long rainy day without a single ray of brightness from the blessed sun to help us through it then labour is resumed with an unwilling and dissatisfied spirit what does it signify to us cry the worn-out labourers whether the harvest yields ill or well whether the years of corn be heavy or light makes no difference to us why should we overwork ourselves or trouble our heads with matters that only concern our master it is sufficient for us to act with strict honesty we will not commit any crime because there are laws ready to punish such as do but neither will we try to perform acts of goodness because for those the laws provide no recompense such a mode of arguing my boys is as unwise as it is wrong and sinful but depend upon it it is true to nature from this indifference comes idleness and from idleness to crime the distance is very short now unfortunately among the class i have been describing the far greater proportion consists of those whose conduct may be considered as neither good nor bad that is to say without any particular leaning either way and consequently a mere trifle might firmly enlist them in the service of virtue or vice these are the very individuals continued our master we ought to try and improve just as we should have done had they been born to the honour of figuring as animals with hoofs horns or woolly coats let us continue to point out to them how completely it is to their interest to be active industrious steady and well qualified to discharge their several duties let us effectually convince them that by becoming better men they will also be much happier let them see how closely their good behaviour and prosperity are interwoven and that good advice may sink the deeper into their hearts give them as it were such a taste of earthly comfort as shall in a slight degree communicate to them the hope and notion of expecting the unspeakable reward prepared by the great giver of all whose dwelling is on high having well arranged his plans our master caused it to be made known in the environs that he wished to engage twelve farm servants six men and six females but that his choice would be entirely regulated by the most satisfactory certificates of good conduct obtained from the civil and religious authorities in their native place they were to be paid like princes fed upon the best food to their hearts content and further a tenth part of the produce of the harvest was to be shared among the labourers the engagement at the farm was to last but two years at the end of which time they were to give place to other labourers chosen upon the same terms but at the expiration of five years the original labourers were taken on again in the event of there being any vacancies so that since the establishment of this farm it is usual for the labourers and working classes in the neighbourhood to say let us be active honest and industrious so as to obtain a high character for such good qualities and perhaps one day we may be fortunate to get engaged at bouqueval farm there for a couple of years we shall lead a life of perfect happiness we shall learn our business thoroughly we shall save a little money so that when our time is up every one will be glad to engage us because they know that we must have had first-rate characters to have been admitted on the establishment at all i am already bespoke by m dubreuil for his farm at arnouville said jean rené and i am engaged to a first-rate service at gonesse chimed in another labourer you see my good friend by this plan everybody is a gainer the neighbouring farmers particularly there are but twelve places for servants on the farm but there are perhaps fifty candidates who have all earned their right to solicit an engagement by certificates and testimonials of excellent conduct well though thirty-eight out of the fifty must be disappointed yet the good which is in them will still remain and there are so many good and deserving characters in the environs we can safely reckon upon for though they have failed in this application 
they still live in hopes of succeeding another time why for every prize animal to which the medal is assigned whether for swiftness strength or beauty there must be a hundred or more trained to stand forward and dispute the choice and those animals rejected do not lose any of those qualifications because they were not accepted far from it their value is acknowledged and they quickly find persons desirous of possessing them now friend said father chatelain having fairly talked himself out of breath do you not confess that i was right when i said ours was no common farm any more than our employer was no ordinary master indeed said the schoolmaster your account is most interesting and fully bears out all you asserted but the more i hear of the exalted views and noble generosity of your master the more earnestly do i pray he may be induced to look with pity on my wretched condition to such a man so filled with a desire to improve the condition of god's creatures a charitable action more or less would make but little difference oh tell me beforehand his name and that of your kind lady of the ready help that i may already bless and thank them for full certain am i mine so bent upon good deeds will never turn a deaf ear to my petition now i dare say you expect to be told the high-sounding titles of some great grand personages but bless you no such thing no more parade about their names than those of the saints themselves our lady of help is called madame georges and our good master plain monsieur rodolphe merciful powers my wife my judge my executioner faintly exclaimed the robber struck almost speechless at this unexpected revelation rodolphe madame georges it was wholly impossible for the schoolmaster to entertain a doubt respecting the identity of the persons to whom those names belonged previously to adjudging him his fearful punishment rodolph had spoken of the lively interest he took in all that concerned madame georges the recent visit of the negro david to this farm was another conclusive proof of there being no mistake in the matter it seemed as though the very hand of providence had brought about this singular rencontre overthrowing it as it so completely did his recently cherished hopes of emancipation from his present misery through the intervention of the generosity of the proprietor of this farm to fly was his first impulse the very name of rodolph inspired him with the most intense terror possibly he was even now in the house scarcely recovered from his first alarm the brigand rose from the table and grasping the hand of tortillard exclaimed in a wild and terrified manner let us be gone quick lead me hence let us go i say the whole of the servants looked on with astonishment go said father chatelain with much surprise why wherefore should you go what are you thinking about my friend come what fresh whim is this are you quite in your right senses tortillard cleverly availed himself of this last suggestion and uttering a deep sigh touched his forehead significantly with his forefinger so as to convey to the minds of the wondering labourers the impression that his pretended parent was not quite right in his head the signal elicited a corresponding gesture of pity and due comprehension come i say come persisted the schoolmaster endeavouring to draw the boy along with him but fully determined not to quit such comfortable quarters to wander about in the fields all night during the frost and snow tortillard began in a whimpering voice to say oh dear oh dear poor father has got one of his old fits come on again there there father sit down and keep yourself quiet pray do and don't think of wandering out in the cold it would kill you maybe no not if you are ever so angry with me will i be so wicked as to lead you out in such weather then addressing himself to the labourers he said will none of you good gentlemen help me to keep my poor dear father from risking his life by going out to-night yes yes my boy answered father chatelet make yourself perfectly easy we will not allow your father to quit the place he shall stay here to-night in spite of himself surely you will not keep me here against my will inquired the wretched schoolmaster in hurried accents and perhaps too i should offend your master by my presence that monsieur rodolphe you told me the farm was not an hospital 
once more therefore i ask you to let me go forth in peace on my way offend our master that you would not i am quite sure but make yourself easy on that score i am sorry to say that he does not live here neither do we see him half as frequently as we would wish but if even he had been here your presence would have made no sort of difference to him no no persisted the blind man with continued alarm i have changed my mind about applying to him my son is right no doubt my relation at louvre will take care of me i will go there at once all i have got to say replied father chatelain kindly conceiving that he was speaking to a man whose brain was unhappily affected is just this that to attempt to proceed on your journey with this poor child to-night is wholly out of the question come let me put matters to rights for you and say no more about it end of chapter seven part three read by celine major chapter seven part four of the mysteries of paris volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain the mysteries of paris by eugene sue chapter seven part four although now being reassured of rodolph's not being at bouqueval the terrors of the schoolmaster were by no means dissipated and spite of his frightfully disfigured countenance he was in momentary dread of being recognized by his wife who might at any moment enter the kitchen when he was perfectly persuaded she would instantly denounce and give him into custody his firm impression having been from the hour of receiving his horrible punishment from the hands of rodolph that it was done to satisfy the hatred and vengeance of madame georges but unable to quit the farm the ruffian found himself wholly at the mercy of tortillard resigning himself therefore to what was unavoidable yet anxious to escape from the eyes of his wife he said to the venerable labourer since you kindly assure me my being here will in no way displease either your master or mistress i will gladly accept your hospitality but as i am much fatigued and must set out again at break of day i would humbly ask permission to go at once to my bed oh yes to-morrow morning by all means and as soon as you like we are very early people here and for fear even that you should again wander from the right road some one will conduct you part of the way if you have no objection said jean rené addressing father chatelet i will see the poor man a good step on the road because madame georges said yesterday i was to take the chaise and go to the lawyers at villiers le bel to fetch a large sum of money she requires of him go with the poor blind traveller by all means replied father chatelet but you must walk mind madame has changed her mind about sending to villiers le bel and wisely reflecting that it was not worth while to have so large a sum of money lying useless at the farm has determined to let it remain with the lawyer till monday next which will be the day she requires it of course father chatelain mistress knows best but least to tell me why she should consider it unsafe to have money at the farm what is she afraid of of nothing my lad thank god there is no occasion for fear but for all that i would much rather have five hundred sacks of corn on the premises than ten bags of crowns come said old chatelain addressing himself to the brigand and tortillard come follow me friend and you too my lad then taking up a small lamp he conducted his two guests to a chamber on the ground floor first traversing a large passage into which several doors opened placing the light on a table the old labourer said to the schoolmaster here is your lodging and may god grant you a good and peaceful night's repose my good friend and as for you my little man you are sure to sleep sound and well it belongs to your happy age to do so the schoolmaster pensive and meditative sat down by the side of the bed to which tortillard conducted him at the instant when father chatelain was quitting the room tortillard made him a sign indicative of his desire to speak with him alone and hastily rejoined him in the passage what is it my boy you have to say to me inquired the old man kindly ah oh, my kind sir i only wanted to say that my father is frequently seized during the night with most violent convulsion fits which require a much stronger person than i am to hold him should i be obliged to call for help is there any person near who could hear me poor child 
said the labourer sympathizingly make yourself easy there do you see that door beside the staircase oh yes good kind gentleman i see it well one of the farm labourers sleeps in that room you will only just have to run to him he never locks his door and he will come to your father in an instant thank you sir god bless you i will remember all your kindness when i say my prayers but suppose sir the man and myself were not strong enough together to manage my poor father when these violent convulsions come on could you who look so good and speak so kind could you be kind enough to come and tell us what to do me my boy oh i sleep as well as all the other men servants out of the house in a large outbuilding in the courtyard but make yourself quite comfortable jean rené could manage a mad bull he is so powerful besides if you really wished any further help he would go and call up our old cook she sleeps on the first floor even with our mistress and young mademoiselle and i can promise you that our old woman is a most excellent sick nurse should your father require any one to attend him when the fit is over thank you kind gentlemen a thousand times good night sir i will go now and pray of god to bless you for your kindness and pity to the poor blind good night my lad let us hope both you and your father will enjoy a sound night's rest and have no occasion to require any person's help you had better return to your room now your poor father may be wanting you i will sir good night and thank you god preserve you both my child and the old man returned to the kitchen scarcely had he turned his back than the limping rascal made one of those supremely insulting and derisive gestures familiar to all the blackguards of paris consisting in slapping the nape of the neck repeatedly with the left hand darting the right hand quite open continually out in a straight line with the most consummate audacity this dangerous child had just gleaned under the mask of guileless tenderness and apprehension for his father information most important for the furtherance of the schemes of the chouette and the schoolmaster he had ascertained during the last few minutes that the part of the building where he slept was only occupied by madame georges fleur de marie an old female servant and one of the farm labourers upon his return to the room he was to share with the blind man tortillard carefully avoided approaching him the former however heard his step and growled out where have you been you vagabond what you want to know do you old blinden oh i'll make you pay for all you have made me suffer this evening you wretched urchin exclaimed the schoolmaster rising furiously and groping about in every direction after tortillard feeling by the walls as a guide i'll strangle you when i catch you you young fiend you infernal viper poor dear father how prettily he plays at blind man's bluff with his own little boy said tortillard grinning and enjoying the ease with which he escaped from the impotent attempts of the schoolmaster to seize him who though impelled to the exertion by his overboiling rage was soon compelled to cease and as had been the case before to give up all hopes of inflicting the revenge he yearned to bestow on the impish son of bras rouge thus compelled to submit to the impudent persecution of his juvenile tormentor and await the propitious hour when all his injuries could safely be avenged the brigand determined to reserve his powerless wrath for a fitting opportunity of paying off old scores and worn out in body by his futile violence threw himself swearing and cursing on the bed dear father sweet father have you got the toothache that you swear so ah if monsieur le cure heard you what would he say to you he would give you such penance oh my that's right go on replied the ruffian in a hollow and suppressed voice after long enduring this entertaining vivacity on the part of the young gentleman laugh at me mock me make sport of my calamity cowardly scoundrel that you are that is a fine noble action is it not just worthy of such a mean ignoble contemptible soul as dwells within that wretched crooked body oh how fine we talk how nice we preach about being generous and all that don't we cried tortillard bursting into peals of laughter i beg your pardon dear father but i can't possibly help thinking it so funny to hear you whose fingers were regular fish-hooks picking and stealing whatever came in their way and as for generosity i beg you don't mention it 
because till you got your eyes poked out i don't suppose you ever thought of such a word but at least i never did you any harm why then torment me thus because in the first place you said what i did not like to the chouette then you had a fancy for stopping and playing the fool among the clodhoppers here perhaps you mean to commence a course of asses milk you impudent young beggar if i had only had the opportunity of remaining at this farm which i now wish sunk in the bottomless pit or blasted with eternal lightning you should not have played your tricks of devilish cruelty with me any longer you to remain here that would be a farce who then would madame la chouette have for her bête de souffrance me perhaps thank you don't you wish you may get it miserable abortion abortion ah yes another reason why i say as well as aunt chouette there is nothing so funny as to see you in one of your unaccountable passions you who could kill me with one blow of your fist it's more funny than if you were a poor weak creature how very funny you were at supper to-night dieu de dieu what a lark i had all to myself why it was better than a play at the gaite at every kick i gave you on the sly your passion made all the blood fly in your face and your white eyes became red all round they only wanted a bit of blue in the middle to have been real tricolored they would have made two fine cockades for the town sergeant wouldn't they come come you like to laugh you are merry bah it's natural at your age it's natural i'm not angry with you said the schoolmaster in an air of affected carelessness hoping to propitiate tortillard but instead of standing there saying saucy things it would be much better for you to remember what the chouette told you you say you are very fond of her you should examine all over the place and get the print of the locks didn't you hear them say they expected to have a large sum of money here on monday we will be amongst them then and have our share i should have been foolish to have stayed here i should have had enough of these asses of country people at the end of the week shouldn't i boy asked the ruffian to flatter tortillard if you had stayed here i should have been very much annoyed pon my word and honour replied bras rouge's son in a mocking tone yes yes there's a good business to be done in this house in that there should be nothing to steal yet i will return here with the chouette if only to have my revenge said the miscreant in a tone full of fury and malice for now i am sure it is my wife who excited that infernal rodolph against me he who in blinding me has put me at the mercy of all the world of the chouette and a young blackguard like yourself well if i cannot avenge myself on him i will have vengeance against my wife yes she shall pay me for all even if i set fire to this accursed house and bury myself in its smouldering ruins yes i will i will have you will you want to get hold of your wife eh old gentleman she is within ten paces of you that's vexing ain't it if i liked i could lead you to the door of her room that's what i could for i know the room i know it i know it i know it added tortillard singing according to his custom you know her room said the schoolmaster in an agony of fervent joy you know it i see you coming said tortillard come play the pretty and get on your hind legs like a dog when they throw him a dainty bone now old cupid you know my wife's chamber said the miscreant turning to the side whence the sound of tortillard's voice proceeded yes i know it and what's still better only one of the farm servants sleeps on the side of the house where we are i know his door the key is in it click one turn and he's all safe and fast come get up old blind cupid who told you all this asked the blind scoundrel rising involuntarily capital cupid by the side of your wife's room sleeps an old cook one more turn of the key and click we are masters of the house masters of your wife and the young girl with the grey mantle that you must catch hold of and carry off now then your pa old cupid do the pretty to your master directly you lie you lie how could you know all this why i'm lame in my leg but not in my head before we left the kitchen i said to the old guzzling labourer that sometimes in the night you had convulsions and i asked him where i could get assistance if you were attacked 
he said if you were attacked i might call up the manservant and the cook and he showed me where they slept one down the other upstairs in the first floor close to your wife your wife your wife and tortillard repeated his monotonous song after a lengthened silence the schoolmaster said to him in a calm voice but with an air of desperate determination listen boy i have stayed long enough lately yes yes i confess it i had a hope which now makes my lot appear still more frightful the prison the bagne the guillotine are nothing nothing to what i have endured since this morning and i shall have the same to endure always lead me to my wife's room i have my knife here i will kill her i shall be killed afterwards but what of that my hatred swells till it chokes me i shall have revenge and that will console me what i now suffer is too much too much for me too before whom everybody trembled now lad if you knew what i endure even you would pity me even now my brain appears ready to burst my pulse beats as if my veins would burst my head whirls a cold in your knowledge box old chap that's it sneeze that'll cure you said tortillard with a loud grin what say you to a pinch of snuff old brick and striking loudly on the back of his left hand which was clenched as if he were tapping on the lid of a snuff-box he sang j'ai du bon tabac dans ma tabatière j'ai du bon tabac tu n'en auras pas oh mon dieu mon dieu they will drive me mad cried the brigand becoming really almost demented by a sort of nervous excitement arising from bloodthirsty revenge and implacable hatred which in vain sought to satiate itself the exuberant strength of this monster could only be equalled by the impossibility of satisfying his deadly desires let us imagine a hungry furious maddened wolf teased during a whole day by a child through the bars of his den and scenting within two paces of him a victim who would at once satisfy his hunger and his rage at the last taunt of tortillard the brigand almost lost his senses unable to reach his victim he desired in his frenzy to shed his own blood for his blood was stifling him one moment he resolved to kill himself and had he had a loaded pistol in his hand he would not have hesitated he fumbled in his pocket and drew out a clasp-knife opened it and raised it to strike but quick as were his movements reflection fear and vital instinct were still more rapid the murderer lacked courage his arm fell on his knees tortillard had watched all his actions with an attentive eye and when he saw the finale of this pseudo tragedy he continued mockingly how boys a duel ah pluck the chickens the schoolmaster fearing that he should lose his senses if he gave way to an ineffectual burst of fury turned a deaf ear to this fresh insult of tortillard who so impertinently commented on the cowardice of an assassin who recoiled from suicide despairing of escape from what he termed by a sort of avenging fatality the cruelty of his cursed child the ruffian sought to try what could be done by assailing the avarice of the son of bras rouge ah said he to him in a tone almost supplicatory lead me to the door of my wife's room and take anything you like that's in her room and run away with it leave me to myself you may cry out murder if you like they will apprehend me kill me on the spot i care not i shall die avenged if i have not the courage to end my existence myself oh lead me there lead me there depend on it she has gold jewels anything and you may take all all for yourself for your own do you mind your own only lead me to the door where she is yes i mind well enough you want me to lead you to her door then to her bed and then to tell you when to strike then to guide your hand hey that's it ain't it you want to make me a handle to your knife old monster replied tortillard with an expression of contempt anger and horror which for the first time in his life gave an appearance of seriousness to his weasel face usually all impertinence and insolence i'll be killed first i tell you sooner than i'll lead you to where your wife is you refuse the son of bras rouge made no reply he approached with bare feet and without being heard by the schoolmaster who seated on the bed still held his large knife in his hand and then in a moment with marvellous quickness and dexterity 
Tortillard snatched from him his weapon, and with one jump skipped to the further end of the chamber. "'My knife! My knife!' cried the brigand, extending his arms. "'No, for then you might to-morrow morning ask to speak with your wife and try to kill her, since, as you say, you have had enough of life, and are such a coward that you don't dare kill yourself.' "'How he defends my wife against me!' said the bandit, whose intellect became obscure. "'This little wretch is a devil! Where am I? Why does he try to save her?' because i like it said tortillard whose face resumed its usual appearance of sly impudence ah is that it murmured the schoolmaster whose mind was wandering well then i'll fire the house we'll all burn all i prefer that furnace to the other the candle the candle ah ha ha exclaimed tortillard bursting out again into loud laughter if your own candle your peepers had not been snuffed out and for ever you would have known that ours had been extinguished an hour ago and tortillard sang ma chandelle est morte je n'ai plus de feu the schoolmaster gave a deep groan stretched out his arms and fell heavily on the floor his face on the ground and struck by a rush of blood remained motionless not to be caught old boy said tortillard that's only a trick to make me come to you that you may serve me out when you have been long enough on the floor you'll get up poire rouge's boy resolved not to go to sleep for fear of being surprised by the schoolmaster so seated himself in a chair with his eyes fixed on the ruffian persuaded that it was a trap laid for him and not believing the schoolmaster in any danger that he might employ himself agreeably tortillard drew silently and carefully from his pocket a little red silk purse and counted slowly and with looks of joy and avarice the seventeen pieces of gold which it contained tortillard had acquired his ill-gotten riches thus it may be remembered that madame d'harville was nearly surprised by her husband at the rendezvous which she had granted to the commandant rodolphe when he had given the purse to the young lady had told her to go up to the fifth story to the morels under the pretence of bringing them assistance madame d'harville ran quickly up the staircase holding the purse in her hands when tortillard who was coming from the quacks caught a glimpse of the purse and pretending to stumble as he passed the marquise pushed against her and in the shock slyly stole the purse madame d'harville bewildered and hearing her husband's footsteps hurried on to the fifth story without thinking or complaining of the impudent robbery of the little cripple after having counted and recounted his gold tortillard cast his eyes towards the schoolmaster who was extended still on the ground disquieted for a moment he listened and hearing the robber breathe freely he thought that he was still meditating some trick against him chance saved the schoolmaster from a congestion of the brain which else must have proved mortal his fall had caused a salutary and abundant bleeding at the nose he then fell into kind of a feverish torpor half asleep half delirium and then had this wild this fearful dream End of chapter seven part four Read by Celine Major. Chapter Eight of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume Two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mysteries of Paris by Eugène Sue. Chapter Eight: The Dream. This was the schoolmaster's dream. He was again in Rodolphe's house in the Allée des Veuves the saloon in which the miscreant had received his appalling punishment had not undergone any alteration rodolph himself was sitting at the table on which were the schoolmaster's papers and the little saint esprit of lapis which he had given to the chouette rodolph's countenance was grave and sad on his right the negro david was standing motionless and silent on his left was the chourineur who looked on with a bewildered mien in his dream the schoolmaster was no longer blind but saw through a medium of clear blood which filled the cavities of his eyeballs all and everything seemed to him tinted with red as birds of prey hover on motionless wing above the head of the victim which they fascinate before they devour so a monstrous screech owl chouette having for its head the hideous visage of the one-eyed hag soared over the schoolmaster keeping fixed on him her round glaring and green eye this fixed stare was upon his breast like a heavy weight 
the schoolmaster discerned a vast lake of blood separating him from the table at which rodolph was seated then this inflexible judge as well as the chourineur and the negro grew and grew expanding into colossal proportions until they touched the ceiling and then it also became higher in proportion the lake of blood was calm and as unruffled as a red mirror the schoolmaster saw his hideous countenance reflected therein then that was suddenly effaced by the tumult of the swelling waves from their troubled surface there arose a vapour resembling the foul exhalation of a marsh a livid coloured mist of that violet hue peculiar to the lips of the dead in proportion as this miasma rises rises the faces of rodolph the chourineur and the negro continue to expand and expand in an extraordinary manner and always remain above this fearful cloud in the midst of the awful vapour the schoolmaster sees the pale ghosts and those murderous scenes in which he had been the actor in this fantastic mirage he first sees a little ball-headed old man clad in a long brown coat and wearing an eye-shade of green silk he is employing himself in a dilapidated chamber in counting and arranging pieces of gold into piles by the light of a lamp through the window lighted by the dim moonlight reflected on the tops of some high trees waving in the wind the schoolmaster recognizes his own figure pressing his distorted features against the glass following every motion of the old man with glaring eyes then breaking a pane he opens the window itself leaps with a bound upon his victim and stabs him between the shoulders with his long and keen knife the movement is so rapid the blow so quick and sure that the dead body of the old man remains seated in the chair the murderer tries to withdraw his weapon from the dead body he cannot he redoubles his efforts in vain he then seeks to quit the deadly steel impossible the hand of the assassin clings to the handle of the poignard as the blade of the poignard clings to the frame of the wounded man the murderer then hears the sound of clinking spurs and clashing swords in the adjoining room he must escape at all risks and attempts to carry with him the body of the feeble old man from which he cannot withdraw either his weapon or his hand he cannot do even this the light and feeble carcass weighs him down like a mass of lead despite his herculean shoulders his desperate efforts the schoolmaster cannot even stir this overwhelming weight the sound of echoing steps and jingling sabres comes nearer and nearer the key turns in the lock the door opens the vision disappears and then the screech owl flaps her wing and shrieks out it is the old miser of the rue de la roule your maiden murder 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 a moment's darkness then the miasma which covers the lake of blood resumes its transparency and another spectre is revealed the day begins to dawn the fog is thick and heavy a man clothed like a cattle dealer lies stretched dead on the bank of the high road the trampled earth the torn turf proved that the victim had made a desperate resistance the man has five bleeding wounds in his breast he is lifeless yet still he seems to whistle on his dogs calling to them help help but his whistling his cries proceed from five large and gaping wounds each one a death in nature which move like so many complaining lips the five calls the five whistlings all made and heard at once come from the dead man by the mouths of his gushing wounds and fearful are they to hear at this instant the chouette waves her wings and mocks the deathly groans of the victim with five bursts of laughter a laughter as unearthly and as horrible as the madman's mirth and then again she shrieks the cattle dealer of poissy murder 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 protracted and underground echoes first repeat aloud the malevolent laughter of the screech owl then they seem to die away in the very bowels of the earth at this sound two large dogs as black as midnight with eyes glaring like burning coals begin to run rapidly around 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 the schoolmaster baying furiously they almost touch him and yet their bark appears as distant as if carried on the wind of the morning gradually these spectres fade away as the previous one did and are lost in the pale vapour which is continually ascending a new exhalation now arises from the lake of blood and spreads itself on its surface 
it is a sort of greenish transparent mist it resembles the vertical section of a canal filled with water at first he sees the bed of the canal covered in by a thick vase formed of numberless reptiles usually imperceptible to the unassisted eye but which enlarged as if viewed through a microscope assume monstrous forms vast proportions relatively to their actual size it is no longer mud but a compact living crawling mass an inextricable conglomeration which wriggles and curls so close so dense that a sullen and low undulation hardly stirs the level of this vase or rather bed of foulest animalculae above trickles gently gently a turbid stream thick and stagnating which in its dilatory flow disturbs the filth incessantly vomited by the sewers of a great city fragments of all sorts carcasses of animals etc etc suddenly the schoolmaster hears the plash of a body which falls heavily on the water in its recoil the water sprinkles his very face in the midst of the air bubbles which rise thick and fast to the surface of the canal he sees the body of a woman which sinks rapidly as she struggles struggles then he sees himself and the chouette running hastily along the banks of st martin's canal carrying with them a box covered with black cloth and yet he is still present during all the variations of agony suffered by the victim whom he and the chouette have thrown into the canal after the first immersion the victim rises to the surface and moves her arms in violent agitation like some one who not knowing how to swim tries in vain to save herself then she utters a piercing cry a cry of one in the last extremity despairing which ends in the sullen stifled sound of involuntary choking and the woman the second time sinks beneath the troubled waters the screech owl which hovers continually motionless imitates the convulsive rattle of the drowning wretch as she mocked the dying groans of the cattle dealer in the midst of bursts of death-like laughter the screech owl utters glue 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 the subterranean echoes repeated the sound a second time submerged the woman is fast suffocating and makes one more desperate effort for breath but instead of air it is water which she inspires then her head falls back her convulsed features are swollen and become livid her neck becomes blue and tumefied her arms stiffen and in a last spasmodic effort the drowning woman in her agony moves her feet which are resting on the vase then she is surrounded by a mass of black soil which ascends with her to the surface of the water scarcely has the choked wretch breathed her last sigh than she is covered with myriads of the microscopic reptiles the greedy and horrible vermin of the mud the carcass floats for a moment balances for a moment and then sinks slowly horizontally the feet lower than the head and between the double waters begins to follow the current of the land sometimes the dead corpse turns and its pale face is before the schoolmaster then the spectre fixes on him glaringly its two blue glassy and opaque eyes the livid mouth opens the schoolmaster is far away from the drowning woman and yet her lips murmur in his ears glue 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 accompanying these appalling syllables with that singular noise which a bottle thrust into the water makes when filling itself the screech owl repeats glue 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 flapping her wings and shrieking the woman of the canal st martin murder 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 the vision of the drowned woman disappears the lake of blood through which the schoolmaster still constantly beholds rodolph becomes of a bronze black colour then red again and then changes instantaneously into a liquid furnace-like molten metal then that lake of fire rises 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 towards the sky like an immense whirlpool there is now a fiery horizon like iron at a white heat this immense boundless horizon dazzles and scorches the very eyes of the schoolmaster who fascinated fastened to the spot cannot turn away his gaze then at the bottom of this burning lava whose reflection seems to consume him he sees pass and repass one by one the black and giant spectres of his victims the magic lanthorn of remorse 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 shrieks the night-bird flapping her hideous wings and laughing mockingly 
notwithstanding the intolerable anguish which his impatient gaze creates the schoolmaster has his eyes fixed on the grisly phantoms which move in the blazing sheet then an indefinable horror steals over him passing through every step of indescribable torture by dint of contemplating this blazing sight he feels his eyeballs which have replaced the blood with which his orbits were filled at the commencement of his dream he feels his eyeballs grow hot burning and melt in this furnace to smoke and bubble and at last to become calcined in their cavities like two crucibles filled with red fire by a fearful power after having seen as well as felt the successive transformations of his eyeballs into ashes he falls into the darkness of his actual blindness but now suddenly his intolerable agonies are assuaged as though by enchantment an odorous air of delicious freshness passes over his burning eyeballs this air is a lovely admixture of the sense of springtime which exhale from flowers bathed in evening dew the schoolmaster hears all about him a gentle murmur like that of a breeze which just stirs the leaves like that of a brook of running waters which rushes and murmurs on its bed of stone and moss in the leafy month of june thousands of birds warble the most enchanting melodies they are stilled and the voices of children of angelic tone sing strange unknown words words that are winged if we may use the expression and which the schoolmaster hears mount to heaven with gentle motion a feeling of moral health of tranquillity of undefined languor creeps over him by degrees it is an expansion of the heart an elevation of the mind an effort of the soul of which no physical feeling how delicious soever it may be can impart the least idea he feels himself softly soaring in a heavenly sphere he seems to rise to an immeasurable height after having for some months revelled in this unspeakable felicity he again finds himself in the dark abyss of his habitual thoughts his dream continues but he is again but the muzzled miscreant who blasphemes and curses in the paroxysm of his impotent rage a voice is heard sonorous solemn it is rodolph's the schoolmaster starts like a guilty thing upon a fearful summons he has the vague consciousness of a dream but the alarm with which rodolph inspires him is so great that he tries but vainly to escape from this fresh vision the voice speaks he listens the tone of rodolph is not severe it is rather in sorrow than in anger unhappy man he says to the schoolmaster the hour of your repentance has not yet sounded god only knows when it will strike the punishment of your crimes is still incomplete you have suffered but not expiated destiny follows out its work of full justice your accomplices have become your tormentors a woman a child tame subdue conquer you when i sentenced you to a terrible punishment for your crimes i said do you remember my words you have wickedly abused the great bodily strength bestowed upon you i will paralyze that strength the strongest have trembled before you i will make you henceforward shrink in the presence of the weakest of beings you have left the obscure retreat in which you might have dwelt for repentance and expiation you were afraid of silence and solitude you sought to drown remembrance by new crimes just now in a fearful and bloodthirsty access of passion you have wished to kill your wife she is here under the same roof as yourself she sleeps without defence you have a knife her apartment is close at hand there was nothing to prevent you from reaching her nothing could have protected her from your rage nothing but your impotence the dream you have had and in which you are still bound may teach you much may save you the mysterious phantoms of this dream bear with them a most pregnant meaning the lake of blood in which your victims have appeared is the blood you have shed the molten lava which replaced it is the gnawing eating remorse which must consume you before one day that the almighty having mercy on your protracted tortures shall call you to himself and let you taste the ineffable sweetness of his gracious forgiveness but this will not be no no these warnings will be useless far from repenting you regret every day with horrid blasphemies the time when you would commit such atrocities alas from this continual struggle between your bloodthirsty desires and the impossibility of satisfying them 
between your habits of fierce oppression and the compulsion of submitting to beings as weak as they are depraved there will result to you a fate so fearful so appalling ah unhappy wretch rodolph's voice faltered and for a moment he was silent as if emotion and horror had hindered him from proceeding the schoolmaster's hair bristled on his brow what could be would be that fate which even his executioner pitied the fate that awaits you is so horrible resumed rodolph that if the almighty in his inexorable and all-powerful vengeance would make you and your person expiate all the crimes of all mankind he could not devise a more fearful punishment ah woe for you woe for you at this moment the schoolmaster uttered a piercing shriek and awoke with a bound at this horrid frightful dream End of chapter 8 Read by Céline Major Chapter 9, Part 1 of The Mysteries of Paris, Volume 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mysteries of Paris by Eugène Sue Chapter 9, Part 1 The Letter The hour of nine had struck on a Bouqueval clock when Madame Georges softly entered the chamber of Fleur de Marie the light slumber of the young girl was quickly broken and she awoke to find her kind friend standing by her bedside a brilliant winter sun darted its rays through the blinds and chintz window curtains the pink linings of which cast a bright glow on the pale countenance of la goualeuse giving it the look of health it so greatly needed well my child said madame georges sitting down and gently kissing her forehead how are you this morning much better madame i thank you i hope you were not awoke very early this morning no indeed madame i am glad of it the blind man and his son who were permitted to sleep here last night insisted upon quitting the farm immediately it was light and i was fearful that the noise made in opening the gates might have woke you poor things why did they go so very early i know not after you became more calm and comfortable last night i went down into the kitchen for the purpose of seeing them but they had pleaded extreme weariness and begged permission to retire father chatelain tells me the blind man does not seem very right in his head and the whole body of servants were unanimous in praising the tenderness and care with which the boy attended upon his blind parent but now my dear marie listen to me you must not expose yourself to the risk of taking fresh cold after the attack of fever you suffered from last night and therefore i recommend your keeping quite quiet all day and not leaving the parlour at all nay madame i have promised monsieur le curé to be at the rectory at five o'clock pray allow me to go as i am expected indeed i cannot it would be very imprudent i can perceive you have passed a very bad night your eyes are quite heavy i have not been able to rest through the most frightful dreams which pursued me whenever i tried to sleep i fancied myself in the power of a wicked woman who used to torment me most cruelly when i was a child and i kept starting up in dread and alarm i am ashamed of such silly weakness as to allow dreams to frighten me but indeed i suffered so much during the night that when i awoke my pillow was wetted with my tears i am truly sorry for this weakness as you justly style it my dear child said madame georges with affectionate concern seeing the eyes of fleur de marie again filling fast because i perceive the pain it occasions you the poor girl overpowered by her feelings threw her arms around the neck of her adopted mother and buried her sobs in her bosom marie marie my child you terrify me why why is this pardon me dear madame i beseech you indeed i know not myself what has come over me but for the last two days my heart has seemed full almost to bursting i cannot restrain my tears though i know not wherefore i weep a fearful dread of some great evil about to befall me weighs down my spirits and resists every attempt to shake it off come come i shall scold you in earnest if you thus give way to imaginary terrors at this moment claudine whose previous tap at the door had been unheard entered the room what is it claudine madame pierre has just arrived from arnouville in madame dubreuil's chaise he brings a letter for you which he says is of great importance madame georges took the paper from claudine's hand opened it and read as follows dear madame georges 
you could do me a considerable favour and assist me under very perplexing circumstances by hastening to the farm here without delay pierre has orders to wait till you are ready and will drive you back after dinner i really am in such confusion that i hardly know what i am about m dubreuil has gone to the wool fair at pontoise i have therefore no one to turn to for advice and assistance but you and marie clara sends her best love to her very dear adopted sister and anxiously expects her arrival try to be with us by eleven o'clock to luncheon ever yours most sincerely f dubreuil what can possibly be the matter asked madame georges of fleur de marie fortunately the tone of madame dubreuil's letter is not calculated to cause alarm do you wish me to accompany you madame asked the goualeuse why that would scarcely be prudent so cold as it is but upon second thoughts continued madame georges i think you may venture if you wrap yourself up very warm it will serve to raise your spirits and possibly the short ride may do you good the goualeuse did not immediately reply but after a few minutes consideration she ventured to say but madame monsieur le curé expects me this evening at five o'clock at the rectory but i promise you to be back in good time for you to keep your engagement now will you go oh thank you madame indeed i shall be so delighted to see mademoiselle clara what again uttered madame georges in a tone of gentle reproach mademoiselle clara she does not speak so distantly to you when she addresses you oh no madame replied the poor girl casting down her eyes while a bright flush rose even to her temples but there is so great a difference between us that dear marie you are cruel and unkind thus needlessly to torment yourself have you so soon forgotten how i chided you but just now for the very same fault there drive away all such foolish thoughts dress yourself as quickly as you can and pray wrap up very carefully if we are quick we may reach arnouville before eleven o'clock then leaving fleur de marie to perform the duties of her simple toilet madame georges retired to her own chamber first dismissing claudine with an intimation to pierre that herself and niece would be ready to start almost immediately half an hour afterwards madame georges and marie were on their way to arnouville in one of those large roomy cabriolets in use among the rich farmers in the environs of paris and briskly did their comfortable vehicle drawn by a stout norman horse roll over the grassy road which led from bouqueval to arnouville the extensive buildings and numerous appendages to the farm tenanted by m dubreuil in the latter village bore testimony to the wealth and importance of the property bestowed as a marriage portion on mademoiselle césarine de noirmont upon her union with the duc de lucenay the loud crack of pierre's whip apprised madame dubreuil of the arrival of her friend madame georges with fleur de marie who were most affectionately greeted by clara and her mother madame dubreuil was a good-looking woman of middle age with a countenance expressive of extreme gentleness and kindness while her daughter clara was a handsome brunette with rich hazel eyes and a happy innocent expression for ever resting on her full rosy lips which seemed never to open but to utter words of sweetness and amiability as clara eagerly threw her arms around her friend's neck as she descended the vehicle the goualeuse saw with extreme surprise that the kind-hearted girl had laid aside her more fashionable attire and was habited as a simple country maiden why clara said madame georges affectionately returning her embrace what is the meaning of this strange costume it is done in imitation and admiration of her sister marie answered madame dubreuil i assure you she let me have no peace till i had procured her a woollen bodice and a fustian skirt exactly resembling your marie's but now we are talking of whims and caprices just come this way with me added madame dubreuil drawing a deep sigh while i explain to you my present difficulty as well as the cause of my so abruptly summoning you hither but you are so kind i feel assured you will not only forgive it but also render me all the assistance i require following madame georges and her mother to their sitting-room clara lovingly conducted the goualeuse also thither placing her in the warmest corner of the fireside and tenderly chafing her hands to prevent the cold from affecting her then fondly caressing her and styling her again and again her very dear sister marie she playfully reproached her for allowing so long an interval to pass without paying her a visit after the recent conversation which passed between the poor goualeuse and the curé no doubt fresh in the reader's memory it will easily be believed that these tender marks of affection inspired the unfortunate girl with feelings of deep humility 
combined with a timid joy now then dear madame dubreuil said madame georges when they were comfortably seated do pray tell me what has happened and in what manner i can be serviceable to you oh in several ways i will tell you exactly how in the first place i believe you are not aware that this farm is the private property of the duchesse de lucenay and that we are accountable to her alone having nothing whatever to do with the duke or his steward no indeed i never heard that before neither should i have troubled you with so unimportant a matter now but that it forms a necessary part of the explanation i am about to give you of my present need of your kind services you must know then that we consider ourselves as the tenants of madame de lucenay and always pay our rent either to herself or to madame simon her head femme de chambre and really spite of some little impetuosity of temper madame la duchesse is so amiable that it is delightful to have business with her dubreuil and i would go through fire and water to serve her but la that is only natural considering we have known her from her very cradle and were accustomed to see her playing about as a child during the visits she used annually to pay through the estate during the lifetime of her late father the prince de noirmont latterly she has asked for her rent in advance forty thousand francs is not picked up by the roadside as the old proverb says but happily we had laid that sum by as clara's dowry and the very next morning after the request reached us we carried madame her money in bright shining golden louis these great ladies spend so much you see in luxuries such as you and i have no idea of yet it is only within the last twelve month madame de lucenay has wished to be paid beforehand she used always to seem as though she had plenty of money but things are very different now still my dear madame dubreuil i do not yet perceive in what way i can possibly assist you don't be in a hurry i am just coming to that part of my story but i was obliged to tell you all this that you might be able to understand the entire confidence madame la duchesse places in us to be sure she showed her great regard for us by becoming when only thirteen years of age clara's godmother her noble father standing as the other sponsor and ever since madame de lucenay has loaded her godchild with presents and kind attentions but i must not keep you i see you are impatient so i will at once proceed with the business part of my tale you must know then that last night i received by express the following letter from madame de lucenay my dear madame dubreuil you must prepare the small pavilion in the orchard for occupation by to-morrow evening send there all the requisite furniture such as carpets curtains etc etc let nothing be wanted to render it in every respect as comfortable as possible do you mark the word comfortable madame georges inquired madame dubreuil pausing in the midst of her reading it is even underlined then looking up at her friend with a thoughtful puzzled expression of countenance and receiving no answer she continued the perusal of her letter it is so long since the pavilion has been used that it will require large and constant fires both day and night to remove the dampness from the walls i wish you to behave in every respect to the person who will occupy the apartments as you would do to myself and you will receive by the hands of the new visitant a letter from me explanatory of all i expect from your well-known zeal and attachment i depend entirely on you and feel every assurance that i may safely reckon on your fidelity and desire to serve me adieu my dear madame dubreuil remember me most kindly to my pretty goddaughter and believe me ever yours sincerely and truly noirmont de lucenay p s the person whom i so strongly recommend to your best care and attention will arrive the day after to-morrow about dusk pray do your very utmost to render the pavilion as comfortable as you possibly can comfortable again you see and underlined as before said madame dubreuil returning the letter of madame de lucenay to her pocket well replied madame georges all this is simple enough how do you mean simple enough you cannot have heard me read the letter madame la duchesse wishes particularly that the pavilion should be rendered as comfortable as possible now that is the very reason of my asking you to come to me to-day clara and i have been knocking our heads together in vain to discover what comfortable can possibly mean but without being able to find it out yet it seems odd too that clara should not know its meaning for she was several years at school at villiers le bel and gained a quantity of prizes for history and geography however 
she knows as little as i do about that outlandish word i dare say it is only known at court or in the fashionable world however be that as it may madame la duchesse has thrown me into a pretty fuss by making use of it she says and you see twice repeats the words and even underlines it that she requests i will furnish the pavilion as comfortably as possible now what are we to do when we have not the slightest notion of the meaning of that word well heaven be praised then that i can relieve your perplexity by solving this grand mystery said madame georges smiling upon the present occasion the word comfortable merely means an assemblage of neat well chosen well arranged and convenient furniture so placed in apartments well warmed and protected from cold or damp that the occupant shall find everything that is necessary combined with articles that to some might seem superfluities thank you i perfectly understand what comfortable means as regards furnishing apartments but your explanation only increases my difficulties how so madame la duchesse speaks of carpets furniture and many et ceteras now we have no carpets here and our furniture is of the most homely description neither can i make out by the letter whether the person i am to expect is a male or female and yet everything must be prepared by to-morrow evening what shall i do what can i do i can get nothing here really madame georges it is enough to drive one wild to be placed in such an awkward situation but mother said clara suppose you take the furniture out of my room and whilst you are refurnishing it i will go and pass a few days with dear marie at bouqueval my dear child what nonsense you talk as if the humble fittings up of your chamber could equal what madame la duchesse means by the word comfortable returned madame dubreuil with a disconsolate shrug of the shoulders lord lord why will fine ladies puzzle poor folks like me by going out of their way to find such expressions as comfortable then i presume the pavilion in question is ordinarily uninhabited said madame georges oh yes there you see that small white building at the end of the orchard that is it the late prince de noirmont father of madame la duchesse caused it to be built for his daughter when in her youthful days she was accustomed to visit the farm and she then occupied it there are three pretty chambers in it and a beautiful little swiss dairy at the end of the garden where in her childish days madame la duchesse used to divert herself with feigning to manage since her marriage she has only been twice at the farm but each time she passed several hours in the pavilion the first time was about six years ago and then she came on horseback with then as though the presence of clara and fleur-de-marie prevented her from saying more madame dubreuil interrupted herself by saying but i am talking instead of doing and that is not the way to get out of my present difficulty come dear good madame georges and help a poor bewildered creature like myself in the first place answered madame georges tell me how is this pavilion furnished at the present moment oh scarcely at all in the principal apartment there is a straw matting on the centre of the floor a sofa and a few armchairs composed of rushes a table and some chairs comprise all the inventory which i think you will allow falls far short of the word comfortable well i tell you what i should do in your place let me see it is eleven o'clock i should send a person on whom you can depend to paris our overseer there cannot be a more active intelligent person note two a species of overseer employed in most of the large farming establishments in the environs of paris exactly just the right sort of messenger well in two hours at the utmost he may be in paris let him go to some upholsterer in the chaussee d'antin never mind which and give him the list i will draw out after i have seen what is wanting for the pavilion and let him be directed to say that let the expense be what it may i don't care about expense if i can but satisfy the duchess the upholsterer then must be told that at any cost he must see that every article named in the list be sent here either this evening or before daybreak to-morrow with three or four of his most clever and active workmen to arrange them as quickly as possible they might come by the gonesse diligence which leaves paris at eight o'clock every evening and as they would only have to place the furniture lay down carpets and put up curtains all that could easily be done by to-morrow evening oh my dear madame georges what a load you have taken off my mind i should never have thought of this simple yet proper manner of proceeding you are the saving of me 
now may i ask you to be so kind as to draw me out the list of articles necessary to render the pavilion what is that hard word i never can recollect it comfortable yes i will at once set about it and with pleasure dear me here is another difficulty don't you see we are not told whether to expect a lady or a gentleman madame de lucenay in her letter only says a person it is very perplexing isn't it then make your preparations as if for a lady my dear madame dubreuil and should it turn out a gentleman why he will only have better reason to be pleased with his accommodations quite right right again as you always are a servant here announced that breakfast was ready let breakfast wait a little said madame georges and while i draw out the necessary list send some person you can depend upon to take the exact height and width of the three rooms that the curtains and carpets may more easily be prepared thank you i will set our overseer to work out this commission madame continued the servant speaking to her mistress the new dairy-woman from staines is here with her few goods in a small cart drawn by a donkey the beast has not a heavy load to complain of for the poor body's luggage seems but very trifling poor woman said madame dubreuil kindly what woman is it inquired madame georges a poor creature from staines who once had four cows of her own and used to go every morning to paris to sell her milk her husband was a blacksmith and one day accompanied her to paris to purchase some iron he required for his work agreeing to rejoin her at the corner of the street where she was accustomed to sell her milk unhappily as it afterwards turned out the poor woman had selected a very bad part of paris for when her husband returned he found her in the midst of a set of wicked drunken fellows who had for mere mischief's sake upset all her milk into the gutter the poor blacksmith tried to reason with them upon the score of their unfair conduct but that only made matters worse they all fell on the husband who sought in vain to defend himself from their violence the end of the story is that in the scuffle which ensued the man received a stab with a knife which stretched him a corpse before the eyes of his distracted wife dreadful indeed ejaculated madame georges but at least the murderer was apprehended alas no he managed to make his escape during the confusion which ensued though the unfortunate widow asserts she should recognize him at any minute she might meet him having repeatedly seen him in company with his associates inhabitants of that neighbourhood however up to the present hour all attempts to discover him have been useless but to end my tale i must tell you that in consequence of the death of her husband the poor widow was compelled in order to pay various debts he had contracted to sell not only her cows but some little land he possessed the bailiff of the chateau of staines recommended the poor creature to me as a most excellent and honest woman as deserving as she was unfortunate having three children to provide for the eldest not yet twelve years of age i happened just then to be in want of a first-rate dairy-woman therefore offered her the place which she gladly accepted and she has now come to take up her abode on the farm this act of real kindness on your part my dear madame dubreuil does not surprise me knowing you as well as i do here clara said madame dubreuil as though seeking to escape from the praises of her friend will you go and show this good woman the way to the lodge she is to occupy while i hasten to explain to our overseer the necessity for his immediate departure for paris willingly dear mother marie can come with me can she not of course answered madame dubreuil if she pleases then added smilingly i wonder whether you two girls could do one without the other and now said madame georges seating herself before a table i will at once begin my part of the business that no time may be lost for we must positively return to bouqueval at four o'clock dear me exclaimed madame dubreuil how early why what makes you in such a hurry marie is obliged to be at the rectory by five o'clock oh if her return relates to that good abbe laporte i am sure it is a sacred duty with which i would not interfere for the world well then i will go and give the necessary orders for everything being punctual to that hour those two girls have so much to say to each other that we must give them as much time as we can then we shall leave you at three o'clock my dear madame dubreuil yes i promise not to detain you since you so positively wish it but pray let me thank you again and again for coming 
what a good thing it was i thought of sending to ask your kind assistance rejoined madame dubreuil now then clara and marie off with you end of chapter nine part one read by celine major chapter nine part two of the mysteries of paris volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain the mysteries of paris by eugene sue chapter nine part two as madame georges settled herself to her writing madame dubreuil quitted the room by a door on one side while the young friends in company with the servant who had announced the arrival of the milkwoman from stains went out by the opposite side where is the poor woman inquired clara there she is mademoiselle in the courtyard near the barns with her children and her little donkey cart you shall see her dear marie said clara taking the arm of la goualeuse poor woman she looks so pale and sad in her deep widow's mourning the last time she came here to arrange with my mother about the play she made my heart ache she wept bitterly as she spoke of her husband then suddenly burst into a fit of rage as she mentioned his murderer really she quite frightened me she looked so desperate and full of fury but after all her resentment was natural poor thing i am sure i pity her some people are very unfortunate are they not marie alas yes they are indeed replied the goualeuse sighing deeply there are some persons who appear born only to trouble and sorrow as you justly observe miss clara this is really very unkind of you marie said clara colouring with impatience and displeasure this is the second time to-day you have called me miss clara what can i have possibly done to offend you for i am sure you must be angry with me or you would not do what you know vexes me so very much how is it possible that you could ever offend me then why do you say miss you know very well that both madame georges and my mother have scolded you for doing it and i give you due warning if ever you repeat this great offence i will have you well scolded again now then will you be good or not speak dear clara pray pardon me indeed i was not thinking when i spoke not thinking repeated clara sorrowfully what after eight long days absence you cannot give me your attention even for five minutes not thinking that would be bad enough but that is not it marie and i tell you what it is my belief you are too proud to own so humble a friend as myself fleur de marie made no answer but her whole countenance assumed the pallor of death a woman dressed as a widow and in deep mourning had just caught sight of her and uttered a cry of rage and horror which seemed to freeze the poor girl's blood this woman was the person who supplied the goualeuse with her daily milk during the time the latter dwelt with the ogress at the tapis franc the scene which ensued took place in one of the yards belonging to the farm in the presence of all the labourers both male and female who chanced just then to be returning to the house to take their midday meal beneath a shed stood a small cart drawn by a donkey and containing the few household possessions of the widow a boy of about twelve years of age aided by two younger children was beginning to unload the vehicle the milkwoman herself was a woman of about forty years of age her countenance coarse masculine and expressive of great resolution she was as we before stated attired in the deepest mourning and her eyelids looked red and inflamed with recent weeping her first impulse at the sight of the goualeuse had been terror but quickly did that feeling change into grief and rage while the most violent anger contracted her features rapidly darting towards the unhappy girl she seized her by the arm and presenting her to the gaze of the farm servants she exclaimed here is a creature who is acquainted with the assassin of my poor husband i have seen her more than twenty times speaking to the ruffian when i was selling my milk at the corner of the rue de la vieille draperie she used to come to buy a half-worth every morning she knows well enough who it was struck the blow that made me a widow and my poor children fatherless birds of a feather flock together and such loose characters as she is are sure to be linked in with thieves and murderers oh you shall not escape me you abandoned wretch cried the milkwoman who had now lashed herself into a perfect fury and who seeing poor fleur de marie confused and terror-stricken at this sudden attack endeavouring to escape from it by flight grasped her fiercely by the other arm also 
clara almost speechless with surprise and alarm at this outrageous conduct had been quite incapable of interfering but this increased violence on the part of the widow seemed to restore her to herself and angrily addressing the woman she said what is the meaning of this improper behaviour are you out of your senses has grief turned your brain good woman i pity you but let us pass on you are mistaken mistaken repeated the woman with a bitter smile me mistaken no no there is no mistake just look at her pale guilty looks hark how her very teeth rattle in her head ah she knows well enough there's no mistake and you may hold your wicked tongue if you like but justice will find a way to make you speak you shall go with me before the mayor do you hear oh it is not worth while resisting i have good strong wrists i can hold you and sooner than you should escape i would carry you every step of the way you good for nothing insolent woman how dare you to presume to speak in this way to my dear friend and sister your sister mademoiselle clara believe me it is you who are deceived it is you who have lost your senses bawled the enraged milkwoman in a loud coarse voice your sister a likely story a girl out of the streets who was the companion of the very lowest wretches in the worst part of the cite should be a sister of yours at these words the assembled labourers who naturally enough took that part in the affair which concerned a person of their own class and who really sympathised with the bereaved milkwoman gave utterance to deep threatening words in which the name of fleur de marie was angrily mingled the three children hearing their mother speaking in a loud tone and fearing they knew not what ran to her and clinging to her dress burst out into a loud fit of weeping the sight of these poor little fatherless things dressed also in deep mourning increased the pity of the spectators for the unfortunate widow while it redoubled their indignation against fleur de marie while clara completely frightened by these demonstrations of approaching violence exclaimed in an agitated tone to a group of farm labourers take this woman off the premises directly do you not perceive grief has driven her out of her senses marie dear marie never mind what she says she is mad poor creature and knows not what she does the poor goualeuse pale exhausted and almost fainting made no effort to escape from the powerful grasp of the incensed milkwoman she hung her head as though unable to or unwilling to meet the gaze of friend or foe clara attributing her condition to the terror excited by so alarming a scene renewed her commands to the labourers did you not hear me desire that this mad woman might be instantly taken away from the farm however unless she immediately ceases her rude and insolent language i can promise her by way of punishment she shall neither have the situation my mother promised her nor even be suffered to put her foot on the premises again not a person stirred to obey clara's orders on the contrary one of the boldest among the party exclaimed well but miss clara if your friend there is only a common girl out of the streets and as such acquainted with the murder of this poor woman's husband surely she ought to go before the mayor to give an account of herself and her bad companions i tell you repeated clara with indignant warmth and addressing the milkwoman you shall never enter this farm again unless you this very instant and before all these people humbly beg pardon of mademoiselle marie for all the wicked things you have been saying about her you turn me off the premises then mademoiselle do you retorted the widow with bitterness well so be it come my poor children let us put the things back in the cart and go and seek our bread elsewhere god will take care of us but at least when we go we will take this abandoned young woman with us she shall be made to tell the mayor if she won't us who it was that took away your dear father's life for she knows well enough she who was the daily companion of the worst set of ruffians who infest paris and you miss added she looking spitefully and insolently at clara you should not because you choose to make friends with low girls out of the streets and because you happen to be rich be quite so hard-hearted and unfeeling to poor creatures like me no more she ought exclaimed one of the labourers the poor woman is right of course she is she is only standing up for her own poor thing she has no one now to do so for her why they have murdered her husband among them i should think that might content them without trampling the poor woman under foot one comfort is 
nobody can stop her from doing all in her power to bring the murderers of her husband to justice it is a shame to send her away in this manner like a dog can she help it poor creature if miss clara thinks proper to take up with common girls and thieves and make them her companions infamous to turn an honest woman a poor widow with helpless children into the streets for such a base girl as that these different speeches uttered nearly simultaneously by the surrounding crowd were rapidly assuming a most hostile and threatening tone when clara joyfully exclaimed thank god here comes my mother it was indeed madame dubreuil who was crossing the courtyard on her return from the pavilion now then my children said madame dubreuil gaily approaching the assembled group will you come in to breakfast i declare it is quite late i dare say you are both hungry come marie clara mother cried clara pointing to the widow you are fortunately just in time to save my dear sister marie from the insults and violence of that woman oh pray order her away instantly if you only knew what she had the audacity to say to marie impossible clara nay but dear mother only look at my poor dear sister see how she trembles she can scarcely support herself oh it is a shame and disgrace such conduct could ever have been offered to a guest of ours my dear dear friend marie dear look up and say you are not angry with us pray tell me you will try and forget it what is the meaning of all this inquired madame dubreuil looking around her with a disturbed and uneasy look after having observed the despairing agony of the goualeuse and now we shall have justice done to the poor widow woman murmured the labourers madame will see her righted no doubt about it now then exclaimed the milkwoman exultingly here is madame dubreuil now my fine miss continued she addressing fleur de marie you will have your turn of being turned out of doors is it true then cried madame dubreuil addressing the widow who still kept firm hold of fleur de marie's arm that you have dared to insult my daughter's friend as she asserts is this the way you show your gratitude for all i have done to serve you will you leave that young lady alone yes madame replied the woman relinquishing her grasp of fleur de marie at your bidding i will for i respect you too much to disobey you and besides i owe you much gratitude for all your kindness to a poor friendless creature like myself but before you blame me and drive me off the premises with my poor children just question that wretched creature that has caused all this confusion what she knows of me i know a pretty deal more of her than is to her credit for heaven's sake marie exclaimed madame dubreuil almost petrified with astonishment what does this woman allude to do you hear what she says are you or are you not known by the name of the goualeuse said the milkwoman to marie yes said the wretched girl in a low trembling voice and without venturing to lift up her eyes towards madame dubreuil yes i am called so there you see vociferated the enraged labourers she owns it she owns it what does she own inquired madame dubreuil half frightened at the assent given by fleur de marie leave her to me madame resumed the widow and you shall hear her confess that she was living in a house of the most infamous description in the rue aux fèves in the cité and that she every morning purchased a half penny worth of milk of me she cannot deny either having repeatedly spoken in my presence to the murderer of my poor husband oh she knows him well enough i am quite certain a pale young man who smoked a good deal and always wore a cap and a blouse and wore his hair very long she could tell his name if she chose is this true or is it a lie vociferously demanded the milkwoman i may have spoken to the man who killed your husband answered fleur de marie in a faint voice for unhappily there are more than one in the cité capable of such a crime but indeed i know not of whom you are speaking what does she say asked madame dubreuil horror-struck at her words she admits having possibly conversed with murderers oh such lost wretches as she is replied the widow have no better companions at first utterly stupefied by so singular a discovery confirmed indeed by fleur de marie's own admission madame dubreuil seemed almost incapable of comprehending the scene before her 
but quickly the whole truth presented itself to her mental vision and shrinking from the unfortunate girl with horror and disgust she hastily seized her daughter by the dress as she was about to sustain the sinking form of the poor goualeuse and drawing her towards her with a sudden violence she exclaimed clara for heaven's sake approach not that vile that abandoned young woman oh dreadful indeed ever to have admitted her here but how came madame georges to have her under her roof and how could she so far insult me as to bring her here and allow my daughter to this is indeed disgraceful i hardly know whether to trust the evidence of my own senses but madame georges must have been as much imposed on as myself or she never would have permitted such an indignity no no she is incapable of such dishonourable conduct it would indeed be a disgrace for one female to have deceived another poor clara terrified and almost heart-broken at this distressing scene could scarcely believe herself awake it seemed as though she were under the influence of a fearful dream her innocent and pure mind comprehended not the frightful charges brought against her friend but she understood enough to fill her with the most poignant grief at the unfortunate position of la goualeuse who stood mute passive and downcast like a criminal in the presence of a judge come come my child repeated madame dubreuil let us quit this disgraceful scene then turning towards fleur de marie she said as for you worthless girl the almighty will punish you as you deserve for your deceit that my child good and virtuous as she is should ever have been allowed to call you sister or friend her sister you the very vilest of the vile the outcast of the most depraved and lost wretches what hardihood what effrontery you must have possessed to dare to show your face among good and honest people when your proper place would have been along with your bad companions in a prison ay ay cried all the labourers at once let her be sent off to prison at once she knows the murderer let her be made to declare who and what he is she is most likely his accomplice you see exclaimed the widow doubling her fist in the face of the goualeuse that my words have come true justice will overtake you before you can commit other crimes as for you my good woman said madame dubreuil to the milkwoman far from sending you away i shall reward you for the service you have done me in unmasking this infamous girl's real character there i told you murmured the voices of the labourers our mistress always does justice to every one come clara resumed madame dubreuil let us retire and seek madame georges that she may clear up her share of this disgraceful business for she and i never meet again for either she has herself been most dreadfully deceived or her conduct towards us is of the very worst description but mother only look at poor marie oh never mind her let her die of shame if she likes there will be one wicked hardened girl less in the world treat her with the contempt she deserves i will not suffer you to remain another instant where she is it is impossible for a young person like you to notice her in any way without disgracing herself my dear mother answered clara resisting her mother's attempts to draw her away i do not understand what you mean marie must be wrong in some way since you say so but look only look at her she is fainting pity her oh mother let her be ever so guilty pray take pity on her present distress oh mademoiselle clara you are good very very good to pardon me and care for me uttered poor fleur de marie in a faint voice casting a look of unutterable gratitude on her young protectress believe me it was sorely against my will ever to deceive you and daily hourly have i reproached myself for so doing mother exclaimed clara in the most piteous tones are you then so merciless can you not pity her pity returned madame dubreuil scornfully no i waste no pity on such as she is come i say were it not that i consider it the office of madame georges to clear the place of so vile a creature i would have her spurned from the doors as though she carried the plague about her so saying the angry mother seized her daughter's hand and in spite of all her struggles led her away clara continually turning back her head and saying 
marie my sister i know not what they accuse you of but i am quite convinced of your innocence be assured of my constant love whatever they may say or do silence silence i command cried madame dubreuil placing her hand over her daughter's mouth speak not another word i insist fortunately we have plenty of witnesses to testify that after the odious discovery we have just made you were not suffered to remain a single instant with this lost and unfortunate young woman you can all answer for that can you not my good people continued she speaking to the assembled labourers yes yes madame replied one of them we all know well enough that mademoiselle clara was not allowed to stop with this bad girl a single instant after you found out her wickedness no doubt she is a thief or she would not be so intimate with murderers End of chapter nine part two read by celine major